Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher. Well, it is the last Tuesday of the month. I know I haven't done one of these in a while because of all other topics that have been kind of newsworthy. So I'm doing a top 10 Tuesday today, which is about top 10 coding, billing, compliance questions that I've received from my Coding Corner clients. Also, I wanted to clarify what that is because I'm getting a lot of random emails and direct messages through my LinkedIn account and even my Instagram account. Um, for questions, just random things that people are trying to get information. And then, of course, they always want cited, um, you know, published guidance. I am happy to help, but you need to join my Coding Corner membership. And you find that on my website at terryfletcher.net. This is what I do. I'm an independent consultant. Um, We charge for our services. We have an executive membership, which includes an Ask Me Anything um, call every quarter. And we're actually going to have an extra one this quarter. And that's live, a Zoom call. And then we, um, you, you're able to ask questions unlimited for your specialty uh, through email. And it's a yearly uh, fee. So check that out again. And I hope everybody understands that. But this is what we do. And it takes a lot of time and effort to answer over 100 questions a week and make sure that we give you the published guidance and cited regulatory work so that you can bring it back to your uh, offices. It's not free. And so... Um, just wanted to kind of put that out there because we always want to give you a reminder that, again, we're happy to help, but not for free services, just as like you don't give free services as well. Okay, enough of that soapbox. Let me get started here. So top 10, I had some interesting questions this month, and I just thought I would share. One was a question I have not received uh, before, and I thought this was interesting because when I heard this question I was like wow I haven't seen that coded in a really long time so here's the question it talks about those prolonged services for staff members the 99415 and 99416 and the practice that was asking about coding for that they are trying to code that instead of coding a G code um, for diabetic education so Um, They have a wellness and weight loss, weight loss clinic, and um, they have diabetic patients come in there and then they have a staff member that is what they call a diabetic educator. And there is a code for that education, the DSMT. It's a G code for Medicare, GO 108. But that code, you have to have a referral and a physician referral. And the referral process sometimes can get lost or it takes a little bit. And then patients don't end up getting that conversation or that education. Well, that's with everything. I mean, we have uh, prior authorizations with a lot of things. And unfortunately, there's a reason for that. I think the system is a mess, but um, we still have to adhere to the rules why they're still intact. And the one thing you have to keep in mind when it comes to prior authorizations for certain therapies is that um, they want to make sure that the physician referral is because not all diabetics for this particular situation need a counseling visit. So there has to be medical necessity. Um, And also the certified educator has to be certified. Okay, that sounded funny, but I I always say something to my daughter like Sunday brunch is on Sunday. She goes, mother, I know it's on Sunday at Sunday brunch. I'm like, well, some people don't kind of get the concept when it says it has the debt educator has to be certified and it's CBDCE. So there is a, a specific site for this certification and it's not just a medical, you know, clinical staff that can just basically read a brochure to the patient and sit and talk to them. So a couple of things when it comes to billing for something and trying to bill for something when a code already exists. So when you're trying to get around having to have the referral from a physician and then trying to bill for a code 99415 that's now attached to an ENM code, it's tricky because the 99415, and this is a long question, it is an add-on code, just like other prolonged service codes, to an ENM service and it's for clinical staff time, but it says unless you've hit the 30 minutes above what is normal clinical staff time. So it doesn't even start to the 31st minute and then you have to go above that for at least 15 minutes. Then you can't bill for it. And also it says you add it on to the highest highest, um, visit 
that is on the time threshold. So it says um, the starting point is 30 minutes beyond the typical clinical staff time for ongoing management assessment of the patient. And then you can't count the clinical staff time in a time-based visit. So who's knowing when that time clicks in? And because you're adding it on to a time-based code. And so the code descriptor also says that it has to go beyond the highest time in the range of the total time. So just an example, if you're going to attempt to bill this. This is, again, my interpretation after reading it. It seems like 20 times. Let's say you had a new patient who the physician thought they needed counseling or some staff time above and beyond that wasn't separately charged as an infusion or something like that. So you have 99205. You have to hit the maximum threshold, which would have been 74 minutes. Then you have to have 30 more minutes past that 74 minutes to then have your clinical staff time kick in. So now you're at 104 minutes. And then you would have to have 15 to 30 more minutes of staff time. So you're looking at almost, what, two, two and a half hours close to for an additional 20 bucks. And then here's the, the kicker as well. What if the patient's insurance, which it's only billed less than 1% of the time, doesn't cover it? They think it's a non-covered service. Or the payer saying, well, there's DSMT already and you have to have a physician referral. You can't get around it. Do you bill the patient? No. Some providers would want to write it off, which they can't. So yes, you have to bill the patient for things that are non-covered. So it's kind of a mess. So my, I guess my response to this question, 99415 and 416 as clinical staff time, unless you're actually spending and you can prove it over two hours with that patient in that office that day, and it is medically indicated that the staff had to do some things above and beyond that that's not administration administrative, I would stay away from those codes. Just because it exists in the CPT book doesn't mean you have to report it. So that was a, a tough one, and it took me a while to, to kind of get my thoughts in order on that, but that was, that was a very tough one. So the next one has to do with standing orders and actually orders for certain things. So standing orders, unless it's labs, they, they don't work. But let's say that you had a patient come in, again, another code and corner client question, and they were an OB patient. They came in with vaginal bleeding, so an ultrasound transvaginal was ordered. But it was only ordered in the chart. The doctor signed off on the chart, but who put in the order? It wasn't a written order. The nurse actually put the order uh, in through the EMR, and they, you know, they went ahead and, and got the test. So the order is listed as the provider, even though the nurse did. Is that okay? Yes, it actually is. If you look at Medicare and the Benefit Policy Manual 80.6.1 definitions, and they have diagnostic test, treating physician, treating practitioner, testing facility, and they actually have the definition of order. And I thought this was, it was interesting. It says, this is a communication from the treating physician or practitioner requesting that a diagnostic test be performed for a beneficiary. So it's saying that here is how it has to be um, communicated. It can be a written document signed by the treating physician or practitioner, which is hand delivered, mailed, or faxed to the testing facility. You don't have to have, this is no signatures required on these orders, um, paid on the basis of clinical laboratory fee schedule, as long as, as long as it's clear that this was the intent of the physician. This is or a phone call by the treating physician practitioner or their office to the testing facility and well documented, or, an electro, or by electronic mail by the treating physician again or the office to the testing facility. And then it goes on to say if the order is communicated via telephone, both the treating physician or the and their office and the testing facility must both document the phone call in their copies of the beneficiary's medical record. So the physician order is not required to be signed per se, but the, the medical record has to have a clear documentation, has to be clearly documented that their intent was that the test is to be performed. So I think you're covered as if the doctor didn't write the order, but the order is clear within the medical record that that's what they that the doctor wanted for that encounter that day so it's important to make sure you look at, at the record as a whole and like I said when I mentioned at the beginning you know we're responding to these questions I want to find that resource for you so you know what you bring back to your providers and you know you have to look up some of those uh, some of that information with um, the Medicare manual and there's hard to navigate sometimes question three comes up about um, do you have to have a compliance 
manual plan policy in your office if you take a Medicare patient. The OIG says yes, it's required. So for those of you out there that do not have a compliance policy or manual or plan, um, you might want to look into getting that and go to the OIG.gov site. They even give you, you know, guidelines and an outline of what has to be in there. And, you know, first start with your physicians. What are, what are their policies on how physicians are are handled and, and kept to a compliance standard? And then maybe go to revenue cycle management, go to front and back office. Um, you probably should have some, you know, COVID policies as well, since we see that's, that's having an uptick lately. So make sure that you do have some kind of policies in place for compliance. And basically that means you have something that identifies problems, that uh, it helps to prevent problems, and that there's accountability when those problems are identified. So what happens if somebody violates the compliance? Do you just basically slap them on the wrist, say don't do it again, or is there a monetary penalty? How do you deter the behavior? And that has to be within your compliance plan. Question four is actually a really good question. I love this question. So Thank you, Shar, for sending it to me. So this says the patient came into our urgent care center, then followed up with one of our primary care internal medicine physicians. And we're having some pushback from our physicians because we bill them under the same tax ID number. The urgent care center and the physician's office are at the same location and billing. Would the patient be established or new when seeing the primary care physician? So the billers and coders are saying they're established, but the physicians say they don't agree. They think they should be new. Um, because they, the urgent care physicians are credentialed as family practice followed by urgent care. So here's the thing. It's not about the tax ID. It's about the specialty and the fact that they're the same specialty. Urgent care isn't a specialty. It's a location. Okay, just like, you know, um, telehealth is not a, a, a specialty. It's a delivery of care. So when you're determining if a patient is new or established, internal medicine, family practice, pediatrics, um, all of that, they, they kind of go in one um, kind of a bundle there. Now, internal medicine, they sometimes have a carve out, but from what I've seen from Medicare and the private payers, they're like no chance. But the most urgent care physicians are really credentialed as family medicine. And so if they're going from family medicine to family medicine, regardless if they're going from, you know, urgent care to the now the doctor's private practice, you're all under one umbrella, you're owned by the same entity. So it's an established patient when they come to your office, your coders and billers are correct. So question five is a little bit more difficult. So this one says, if a provider places an order at an office visit, so say lab or radiology, and they use an unspecified code, an ICD-10 code, can they use the visit the order was generated from to see if there's a more specific code in the documentation that can be used? So they know they can't go fishing in other visits, but it seems like they should be able to use the note it was generated from. And what happens you know, if they just say, we use the easiest one or the one that was covered? And then the coders, the coders do know they said um, the ones were verifying orders before they were performed, and we do send it back for a more specific code if we get it on the back end. So you can't for orders. If the doctor doesn't put in the specifics of a diagnosis, you can't then just go fishing for one, even if it's in the same um, record. Now you can, if the doctor put an unspecified for that encounter, it, within that encounter, yes, you can use a, a diagnosis that's within that encounter. But when they're generating more work and more diagnostics and further workup and treatment, and they haven't taken the time to get most but more specific, you need to query the physician, send it back and say, we need to get a more specific diagnosis because now, you know, they're the ones that are that are held accountable for the medical necessity. So that's really important to make sure that the doctors know that. There is only one caveat, and that is the um, ICD-10 general guidelines did come out and say last year, the year before, that if it has to do with laterality, so right or left side of the body, then you are able to, if you can glean that from the medical record, then you are, as a coder, able to pull that out. But anything above and beyond that, no, the doctor has to be the one to um, give the specifics for that diagnosis. Question six is cardiology. It basically says, Terry, my cardiologist performed an angioplasty of the proximal LAD, left anterior descending artery, then attempted to rotor blader atherectomy of the proximal LAD, but this part was unsuccessful. So do I bill the angioplasty only, or do I bill the 92924 with a 53 modifier? 
or does the code include the angioplasty even though the atherectomy part was unsuccessful? Well, actually the original question I kind of altered it a little bit said, do I build the 92933? You can't build the 33 because that is um, includes a stent as well. It doesn't look like that was there. So you actually have two choices here and this is going to be up to the coder and I'll tell you what I would recommend. So you could bill 92924 and that is an atherectomy with it what includes the um, the angioplasty with a 53 modifier and hope to get paid. They may not pay it, you may get a denial, they may be asked for um, a report and it could kind of be a mess. Or you can code what you actually ended up with which is 92920 which is the angioplasty. So in this one instance because the what you did you had a completed service I would probably code the 92920. That's just me. So uh, you do have a choice on that one. But that's a really good question. So you knew I was going to get a telehealth question. I just can't seem to get away from it. So number seven talks about the 95 and the 93 modifier. So for Medicare, they've said to use until the end of 2024 the 95 modifier on all telehealth approved services because it will uh, allow for payment parity and also it's kind of their telehealth modifier, if you will. But a lot of the private payers, including Aetna, Cigna, United Healthcare, etc., they want for audio only the 93 modifier, which was released in 2021, which says that this is audio only telecommunications. Medicare has not said to use that, only the private payers have said to use that. So on the 99441 to 443 for established patients, the phone call codes, Medicare wants 95 and private payers seem to want 93 and it's it's only 95 for Medicare for payment parity. Now what I am finding though is that most practices say they're getting payment parity even without the 95 and the 95 makes no sense. It, it, it says that it's interactive audio and video so it bothers me they still want you to use a modifier that isn't accurate. <laughs> so just letting you know that that's what they talk about there. So. Let's go to the next one. Question number eight and nine have to do with critical care. So many providers state in the note, they put in, I will assume, you know, they put in uh, do not resuscitate DNR. But just because they put that in there, I should say we should not assume anything. So, you know, do not resuscitate. Sometimes it's just a standing thing that's put in notes. And if there's not life-saving services or the critical nature of the illness or injury, with a time element of what was done that's at least 30 minutes, then you don't have critical care. You have to have something in there that says it's critical instead of just an acronym that says, you know, if that happens, then do not resuscitate. Question nine it says, I have physicians that assist as long as the patient's on a ventilator, they can bill critical care time. Oh, shoot. <laughs> they say they, they support this statement by saying if they took the patient off the vent, they would die. Well, that's ventilation management, not critical care time. So there is a code for vent management and you have to make sure that you're understanding the difference. So, you know, it can't be prevention. So if you took them off, they would die. Vent management is a code you can report for those services. And if they ended up, somebody did take them off, and they had to resuscitate them or do something so that it, because the patient became critical, now you've got critical care time. So there, there is a difference there, but I do see that quite a bit where there's kind of a, a misunderstanding is, well, what if we said this or what if we just put this in the, in the note, can we then bill for it? And then the, the last one, and this one comes up actually a lot, and I think it's just hard to find a code for it because it is um, not in sequential order in the CPT book. So if your physician did a pericardiocentesis, what is the code? It is 33016. And make sure once you find a code that's in the CPT book that is out of order and you'll see a hashtag in front of it, make sure you highlight it and then highlight the top of your CPT book and write what it is narratively up there or even the code so that when you go searching for it again, you, you can find it. That happens to me all the time with cardioversions. Like, where is that? I couldn't find it. And so just, um, just make sure that you're giving yourself just kind of a, some tricks there so that you don't have to figure out where is that? I can't find it because the CPT sometimes can be a little tough to navigate. Okay, personal tidbit this week. So I don't know, I'm just proud of this. I've been getting in the pool a lot and over the last two months I'm down 40 pounds. So between the pool, changing my diet and really just, you know, trying to eat well, no white sugar, no white flour and focus on 
fruits, vegetables, lean meats, things like that. So I know everyone says it. You can have a couple things in moderation, but if you just stay away from the bad stuff and add in some exercise in your diet, uh, it'll work. And get outside. Vitamin D is important. I mean, I know we can take pills for it, but try to get a little sun in your diet. And yeah, that is part of your diet, or I should say in your routine. And you not only feel better, but every time you take off, what did they say, at least 10 pounds, it's like taking off 300 pounds of impact to your knees. Well, those of us that are over 50, we need that help. So hopefully um, that'll motivate some of you that think, oh, it's, I'm, I'm over it. Well, you know what? Sometimes life tells you that you can't be over it. So that's what it told me recently. So anyway, I hope everyone has a great day. Hope you're finding that time as we're winding down the end of the summer to get outside, not if it's too hot, but enjoy a little bit of barbecuing and um, a little more vacation until we talk again. Also, for those of you that are interested, if you go to podcastawards.com, uh, you can find both of my podcasts, either the hashtag Terry Tuesday from the Compliance Guy, or you can find uh, the NSCHBC podcast, or you can find the Codecast podcast under either business uh, or under uh, Best Female Podcast for People's Choice Awards, and you can vote for me. So if you're there to vote for the podcast, I would truly appreciate it. It's open until the end of Labor Day. So everyone, make it a great rest of your week. Make it a great day, and thank you for listening to the Codecast Podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www dot terry f l e t c h e r dot net podcast producer joe kuzma music producer assassin music <laughs>